Good evening from our headquarters in Kiev. This is the Sunday show on Hromatsky International, the only prime time TV program explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm. And I am Natalia Humenyuk. Of course, a lot of attention is there on French elections, but there is a lot to tell on what's Good happening in our region. Good evening from our headquarters in, in Kiev. In this Ukraine. is the Sunday show on Hromatsky International, the only prime time We have time talked to the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine on U.S. foreign aid storm. reforms and in I Ukraine, Natalia as well as of course, Ukraine. A lot of attention U.S. relations is in the Trump era. Elections, but there is a lot we'll to see how EU money is, is being spent to ease the, the situation at the Eastern Ukrainian checkpoints. We have talked to human rights watch that has Italy. made a rare visit to the next president who are there fighting, as well as the Ukrainian official opening of the Eurovision in the Trump era. Two Ukrainians who really care. We'll see how EU money is being spent to ease the situation at the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine on the U.S. foreign aid reforms. We find full versions of our interview views, reports and analysis. And as well, please follow us on social networks. Our Twitter at Hromatske is working for us 24-7 as long as our Facebook page. In order to find it, just search for Hromatske International and I'll be back in a second. U.S. Congress approved military support for Ukraine, in particular the United States planning to expand military cooperation with Ukraine regarding the border guard service of Ukraine providing equipment and technical support. Besides that, uh, the document also determines the allocation of at least 560 million dollars in support for Ukraine within the federal budget, uh, which is a bit more than one trillion US dollars. Yet earlier there were documents leaked to foreign uh, policy magazine where there was information there would be more than 100 million cut for Ukraine. It's the part of the bigger cut for foreign aid, yet it didn't happen. We had a chance right before those decisions talk to the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Mari Jovanovich. She is here since uh, the last uh, summer, yet she rarely gives televised interview and it was our chance to discuss here. Uh, so what are the Ukraine-U.S. relations in the Trump era and what's happening with the reform? So please watch it. There is a lot to discuss about the U.S.-Ukraine relations and the, um, you know, U.S. support to Ukraine and as well the uh, U.S.-Russian relations, which are very much connected. But the recent uh, news which made a lot of Ukrainians concerned was about the, you know, probable prospects of the U.S. budget for the foreign aid being cut or shortened. What is really important to us is that U.S. taxpayer money um, get the kind of results that not only our our taxpayers are expecting, but the Ukrainian people are expecting. So three years ago, uh, the Ukrainian people said they wanted a change. They wanted health care um, that was patient-centric. Uh, they wanted um, dignity, that everybody um, be treated in the same way, that there would not be corruption. Um, there were a number of very specific desires that the Ukrainian people had. And so working with your government, working with your civil society, um, we have um, provided, we created a number of programs. And uh, what's really important to us is that those programs show results. What are those results? Because, you know, sometimes you speak about the, with the analysts and would say, you know, there is some kind of the frustration with Ukraine, there is much disappointment, and those funds are not that efficient. I'm not speaking about misuse of the funds. We know very well how tracked are the fund money. But in particular, you know, a lot of Ukrainians would be disappointed with the results uh, of the, uh, some of the Ukrainian government institutions. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, as we were talking about before, uh, real transformation takes time, and it's only three years in. Uh, but uh, looking at some of the uh, anti-corruption reforms that have been instituted here, I think our assistance programs have been very helpful uh, with, with many of them. So the ProZoro procurement um, procurement uh, system that was established. Uh, we, we, helped, um, we helped establish that. Uh, the three um, anti-corruption, the new independent anti-corruption institutions, uh, NABU, uh, SAPO, and, um, and the um, uh, Agency Against the Prevention of uh, Corruption, uh, we helped um, 
uh, with uh, the formation of that, we helped in terms of hiring people, um, getting them vetted, um, making sure that um, that uh, that uh, that they're clean, and um, also in terms of training. And we continue to provide support to those organizations. And then where are the, uh, you know, being honest, we're journalists here to ask the questions <coughs> we are worried and our audience is worried. Uh, we knew previously also the, uh, since U.S. is providing funds for particularly for the, you know, um, there were always talks, for instance, for general prosecutor office reform because it's extremely important, the uh, reform of the system of the um, justice was probably the most critical. So how would you see this? Um, the justice sector reforms? Yeah. Um, absolutely critical, whether uh, you're talking about Ukrainians who want um, to be dealt with fairly in, in a court of law, uh, whether you're talking about foreign investors who want to be assured that if there is a business dispute, uh, that they can go to a court of law and have their side be heard uh, with, uh, with no questions. So we, um, we had a, um, a justice program um, that helped draft uh, the very important um, uh, laws and constitutional amendments that were um, that were instituted in, uh, in last spring and, and, and in the fall and uh, we are now um, also working with uh, with all the relevant parties um, with regard to the Supreme Court justice hiring one of the things that we think is absolutely critical is um, establishing uh, an anti-corruption court here in Ukraine because right now you have a prosecutor that is independent and capable. You have, um, I'm sorry, you have an investigator that is capable and independent. You have a prosecutor that is uh, capable and independent. And you need a court system that um, that is also independent um, because if, uh, um, to get the, the kind of uh, results that, that are really required we, by the Ukrainian people. We see it's critical, <clears throat> uh, but really are the particular things you're watching out? I mean, it's not because it's just, you know, a foreign embassy, but particularly because you are you know, fun financially uh, involved in that. So really, um, you know, how satisfied you would be? I, I think that, um, you know, reform is a process. Real transformation takes, um, takes a while. And so what we're looking for is for steady progress. And we are seeing steady progress. Um, and I think the trend lines are going in the right direction. And um, one of the things that is important is not only that um, you know, as, as bringing us back to where we started, that assistance budgets um, are there and that we have good programs. It's also important that, um, that uh, Ukrainian institutions and Ukrainian leaders um, uh, uh, do um, uh, the things that they need to do in order to see those reforms move forward. An overall question. Um, Probably never as this time the Ukrainians are looking at the U.S. policy, inner politics and the foreign policy. You know, there are, Ukraine is in the discussion of the uh, international media. There is a lot of attention. And of course, uh, we can't not ask about that. There are a lot of talks about the ties of the American presidents with Russia. We are looking closely to the, I don't know, talks we, between the Rex Tillerson uh, and the Sergei Lavrov and the others. Uh, but still, um, as I would speak on maybe on behalf of the, some of the Ukrainian citizens, there are the concerns about the way the U.S. president speaks about Russia, um, you know, more or less in more positive way um, than it was expected by the Ukrainian, uh, not just Ukrainian, but some of the populations. So really what you would say on that, we really know the statements of the State Department, but uh, since you are an ambassador, obviously every Ukrainian would ask about that. Yeah, I am very optimistic about the direction that uh, Ukrainian-American relations are going. I think that, um, you know, if you look at the strong support that Ukraine has traditionally had but continues to enjoy on the Hill, um, and in this administration, I think we have, um, you know, uh, the, the, the foundation for very, uh, for very positive development. Um, 
you know, you, you mentioned State Department statements and um, obviously Secretary Tillerson, both when he was in Brussels um, several weeks ago at the, um, uh, at the uh, NATO-Ukraine Commission meeting, uh, and uh, then when he went to Moscow uh, and met with uh, Secretary Lavrov, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and President Putin, he said exactly the same thing, that, um, you know, that we are committed, um, we are committed to Ukraine, that Russia uh, needs to take the first step uh, in terms of, um, of uh, what is happening with regard to, uh, to the East, um, and that we are committed to sanctions, both in Crimea and Donbass, until we see those positive steps moving forward. So I think that, um, I think that we are on a very, uh, very positive uh, trajectory. How would you explain the, this kind of a totally different discourse you would have everywhere on the concerns of the president himself, you know, involvement in Ukraine, in, the, in relations with Russia? You know, I think that... Because there are doubts. There, previously, there were never doubts, more or less, and now they are. Well, I think that with every new administration, there is a shaking out period. And I think that what we're seeing are a lot of really positive steps forward. And, um, you know, whether, uh, and, and so I, 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 I'm really very optimistic. And I think that that would be in keeping with 25 years of strong, um, of a strong bilateral uh, relationship between the United States and Ukraine. Excellency, today we have the Freedom Day, uh, the day of press freedom, uh, and uh, you know, there were always, I, I said that the statements supporting the independent reporting in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, also by the U.S. government, yet, uh, I mean, we also closely following the U.S. media environment, and there are a lot of talks with the t tension of the, you know, current administration with the U.S. media. So, in that regards, kind of very hard to understand how the um, the relevance of the how the issue of the independent medium would be I don't know strongly supported and addressed by the particularly you know current administration well I think that uh, first of all let me congratulate you with uh, with uh, world press freedom day I think it's a really important day um, that um, you know every May 2nd we take a moment to remember uh, the important job that journalists all over the world do uh, you're doing it here at Hermanskaya. Um others um, are doing it um, in uh, equally um, difficult or uh, dangerous uh, situations and uh, and we need to honor that that work because I think it is absolutely critical uh, in a democracy that um, the citizens of a country get unbiased information. Uh, we are all entitled to our opinions, um, but we don't get our own facts. And it's important that journalists um, be able to go out, talk to people, report on the facts, and provide citizens with the information so that citizens can make their own um, uh, well-informed decisions about what kind of a health care system they want, or about who they want to vote for president, uh, what they think about various things. And that is the absolutely critical function that uh, journalists and, and journalism provides uh, in, in, um, in, in, in any country. And, and so we want to honor that. Not just uh, the U.S., but a lot of foreign governments are supporting Ukraine financially, especially regarding the conflict. Five, seven thousand people every day are crossing checkpoints between the government-controlled areas of the eastern Ukraine and so-called Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republic. There are always lines at the checkpoints. Uh, the European Union had allocated 130,000 US dollars in order to improve the situation. How money are spent? Is this help efficient? Uh, does it make the life easier for the people, first of all? Our correspondent traveled to the spot to look at that. Здесь люди проходят, идут на вход в Украину, это проход, здесь никто не стоит. А туда можно пройти на автобус? Можно пройти на автобус? Да. Пойдем на автобус. 
3,5 мільйони гривень Європейський Союз виділив, щоб прискорити процес перетину лінії розмежування для мирних жителів тут, у Донецькій та Луганській областях. На ці гроші Організація Об'єднаних Націй облаштувала додаткові пункти паспортного контролю. Тепер ми маємо можливість або більший обсяг пасажирів пропускати через певний проміжок часу, або просто швидше, одна людина швидше проходить контроль. Потрапити на непідконтрольну територію можна через п'ять пунктів пропуску – Майорськ, Новотроїцьке, Мар'янка, Гнутове та Станиця Луганська. На трьох з них тепер збільшено пропускну здатність. Ми побували на Майорську під Горлівкою. Кожен день через нього проходить 5-7 тисяч людей, які виїжджають на контрольовану урядом територію за ліками, харчами, пенсіями та провідати родича. Перетнути лінію розмежування на Майорську можна машиною або пішки. Це дві окремі черги. Нові пункти паспортного контролю за задумом мають полегшити життя та саме пішоходам. Замість чотирьох віконець перевірки документів для них тепер працює десять. Для автомобілістів змін не передбачено. Інвалід першої групи, ми прошу раз ночували, втром встали, памперс повний, не помитися, не по... нас навіть не пропустили на ось цей мед, щоб його помити, щоб памперс поміняти. Так, а ага. чому вам відказують в льготній очереді? Сказали, що немає льготної очереді, їжджайте на місце. Тож, чи стали черги меншими для пішоходів? Зимою було б швидше, тому що і за морозу пропускали. Зараз... А ви часто їздите? Ні. Скільки у вас звичайно часу займає пересічення? 4-5 часов. А сегодня вот сколько? Ну, сегодня ну, с 5 утра. Вот. Что-нибудь изменилось после того, как эти новые вагончики Нет. тут поставили? Нет. Нет. Столько Нет. же времени вы тратите, как раньше? Да, да. Еще больше. Еще. Не, не знаю, почему так. Но людей очень много всегда. Пробусов бы больше давали, и людей бы меньше. А то он, людей сколько скопилось, и автобусов нет. Щоб перетнути лінію розмежування, дійсно треба вистояти у двох різних чергах. Спочатку в чергу на паспортний контроль. Тут очікування, за словами людей, триває від однієї до трьох годин. Після цього треба стати у ще одну чергу – на автобус до так званого нуля – останнього українського блокпосту. Швидкість руху цієї черги залежить від автобусів, яких, як виявилося, бракує. Ще два, мабуть, з половиною на паспортний контроль. Тільки. Стоїте в першій очереді, два з половиною часа. Скільки ще потім в автобус не можна тут простояти? Це в залежності від того, як автобус. Да, не Скільки, якщо час, то... Да. А якщо рідко? Довго можна теж простати. От бачите, як воно йде. Кругом. Автобусне сполучення – це відповідальність Донецької військово-цивільної адміністрації. Ще у жовтні 2016 року, під час відкриття КПВВ «Майорськ», її очільник Павло Жибрівський пообіцяв забезпечити людей автобусами до нуля. Ми оголошуємо конкурс для перевізників. Має бути здорова конкуренція і нормальні ціни. Одна з умов конкурсу – щоб вартість проїзду між нульовим блокпостом і КПВВ, а це орієнтовно 1200 метрів, була не більше однієї гривні. Минуло півроку, проте про конкуренцію на Майорську не чули. Тут працює лише один перевізник – Краматорське автотранспортне підприємство, яке пустило на маршрут три мікроавтобуси. Вартість проїзду за один кілометр – 5 гривень. Стільки ж в середньому коштує проїзд у столичних маршрутках на значно більше відстані. У Донецькій облдержадміністрації запевнили, що у випадку великих черг перевізник може надати додаткові автобуси. Проте це рішення він ухвалює на власний розсуд. Тож, поки обласна влада не вирішить питання автобусного забезпечення на контрольно-пропускних пунктах, навряд перед на лінії розмежування стане для людей швидшим та зручнішим. Настя Канарьова, Богдан Кінощук з КПВ «Майорськ» для Громадського. Анекс 
steady revenue just during the tourist season. And our own Hromadsky correspondents had traveled to Crimea and in particular to the village of Popovka where this festival uh, had taken place uh, during the last years and talked to the locals. Do they miss that uh, festival and how their life is changed? Прыгнища, кричи, ура! Ой, маленький ну, ребенок, первый класс. Ну чего, добро было бы, если бы вернулся назад в Казантип. Хоть немножко, уже было бы легче нам. Наркотиков привезли бы сюда побольше, наркоманов. Их везде. А, не правда? Улыбаешься. И на Казантипе их полно. Кто хочет употреблять, то употребляет. А кто не хочет, то и так ничего. А что, вот сейчас приехали на эту, ну, на маёвку, по богатым пошли, и все, богатые опять заработали, а мы опять, как были, так и есть. Пенсия нормально, да. проживем. Не, ну, не прибедняйся. Спасибо Путину, что хоть там пенсию дал. Хорошую можно на пенсию жить. Так что не прибедняйся, Маша, не плачь. Ну, вот не очень-то а хватает, не очень-то ну, хватает. Ну, если ты живешь на широкую ногу, Так нормально. где там на широкую? Тоже, допустим, вот какая-то вот чуть заматочка есть, и то добавляешь до пенсии. Нормально. Суть в том, что я же говорю, люди только на отдыхающей жили. Да, когда только возрождался Казандип, за жалобы шли от места. Музыка, потому что гум, ну здесь пожилые все. Потом все почувствовали, когда что ну, есть заработок какой-то хоть. И тогда уже все успокоилось. А сейчас, наоборот, жаловаться, что его нет. Понимаете, как? Приезжали небольшие группы такие, ребята с девушками. Совсем как по пальцам можно перечесть. Не то, что было в далеком прошлом. Когда все здесь пело, звенело, танцевало, радовало. Было очень дружно, согласованно, интересно и достойно. Так тут кто клевещет, что здесь было безобразие, это неверные представления. Здесь было очень много интересных людей, интересной молодежи, интересные представления. И это радовало. Все живущие здесь и все, которые отдыхали здесь, они все хотят сюда вернуться. And we have as our guest Tanya Cooper, who is Ukraine's researcher at Human Rights Watch. Uh, and she has just come back from Crimea, where Human Rights Watch has the rare visit to the NX Peninsula. So, Tanya, welcome. And what are the major findings? And it's rather rare occasions where you were able to work. Yes, thanks for having me. It's true that Human Rights Watch hasn't been to Crimea since 2015 and it was it was time for us to go back there. We monitored the situation, we documented uh, what was happening there throughout these years, uh, but um, yeah, we did not go 
did not go to Crimea for a while. And of course, you know, what we found is, wasn't surprising. We have, uh, since the occupation uh, in 2014, we have been talking about massive human rights violations in Crimea. And, you know, the human rights crisis that was provoked by Russia's um, occupation of the peninsula continues for, for many people. So uh, if we go in details, because generally we, of course, understand the peculiarity of the annexed territories there that the international organizations compared to the occupied Donbass can't work, like, for instance, the UN or the others, uh, to, to, to be there legally. Um, so really, what are the major points to address after your visit? What would be the case? Well, Russia is an occupying power and the de facto Crimean authorities um, should really address the existing human rights violations. And they were produced what are they? What are yeah, they? and they were produced by, you know, this very fast, very swift uh, uh, forcible uh, requirement for Crimean uh, residents to ap apply and to have Russian passports. That uh, led to discrimination of, um, of, of those who didn't want to do that in spheres of employment, medical, medical care, uh, education. But of course, when we talk about, um, you know, the Crimean Tatar community who were very outspoken uh, in their opposition to the, uh, to the policies of the Russian government in Crimea, uh, they continue to suffer marginalization, isol um, isolation, but also legal harassment uh, of many of their leaders. Um, and, you know, for that matter, any critical voice that peacefully opposes what's happening in Crimea. So um, let's just really talk about those numerous cases. So for instance, in Crimean Tatars, Hromatsky regularly report on the, for instance, the cases of the Hizbut uh so-called allegations of the terrorism, where a lot of people are detained for a while uh, and their families are in drastic situation. Um, but there, there are the accusation of the, um, you know, extremism and terrorism, this is one part of the story. But really, what are the major things if we speak about general on the Crimean Tatar community? Well, uh, you know, the, the community lost its representative body, Majlis, uh, which is now an extremist organization in Russia and Crimea. And what this means practically is that not only the community that fought for their rights for so long, um, and with a lot of determination, with a lot of courage, lost uh, voice, um, they also, you know, anyone, leaders, members of the Majlis are now are effectively outside the law. They are effectively all extremists, criminals, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the eyes of the um, legal system of Russia, just because they, uh, they want to preserve their, their involvement with the with Majlis. But ob obviously, if you were there, there would be people saying, you know, like, we voted for that, we, su we were supporting Russia, that's always the case, which is brought by, by some of the foreign reporters which are coming, and by the Russian uh, state journalists who are saying that, you know, like, you don't have the real conflict and some of the people are satisfied. H how, what have you seen? Well, I mean, you know, I, um, I have... You know, I can accept that a lot of people actually wanted some of the, you know, some of the changes that happened after the occupation. For example, some of the people wanted to be part of Russia, sure, but that shouldn't have come. You know, their um, their wishes and their um, um, you know, willingness to, to support the actions of the Russian government in Crimea shouldn't come at the expense of so many others who didn't agree. And, you know, again, like those, those people who didn't agree, who voiced their opinion peacefully, um, largely, uh, they are right now are being prosecuted for their opinion, for their, you know, unwillingness to accept the, the new policies. You know, when people are speaking about the human rights abuses, they usually speak about the detentions, you know, tortures, other things. And we knew, we know it, it used to happen. There are people who are uh, like Alek Tinsov, who are now in prison in Russia. He's not just the only one, there were the others. Uh, there are numerous cases. But really what I understand uh, interesting is that you look to the other kind of also um, things, uh, so like this regular everyday life of the people uh, which 
also can I, as I understand, can be considered some, you know, a part of the human rights story? Absolutely. And again, this is what we are talking about when we're talking about a human rights crisis, that it doesn't only apply to those who have a certain political position and are, 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 they're not afraid to voice it, um, you know, like a lot of leaders uh, of Crimean Tatar community. But it's also, you know, it's also, you know, this, again, this human rights crisis that resulted um, after the occupation concerned just ordinary people who, for example, uh, had to make a choice to either become a Russian citizen or lose access to health care for themselves and their children and their families. So, for example, we talked to people who um, had a family member uh, dying in, uh, in a hospital as a result of uh, the fact that she was refused uh, to be hospitalized because she wasn't a Russian citizen. We talked to um, a father who had two children who could not continue uh, their education in Ukrainian language because the classes that were, you know, they used to, to go to became uh, Russian language classes. And, you know, he had to, for example, send his son to Lviv to continue, to make sure that he can continue um, receiving education in, uh, in Ukrainian language. Uh, and what else you would say about the um, the economical situation as well? How is it also, uh, is it in your scope as well? Well, we looked, for example, at cases of um, of people either, um, you know, either afraid of losing jobs as a result of their citizenship, which, you know, was not uh, was not Russian citizenship, or those who were actually forced to, uh, forced to resign or, you know, were fired because um, either, again, they didn't have a Russian passport or they had a pro-Ukraine position and were actually activists at some of the you know, public demonstrations that ha happened in Crimea. And as a result, as a result of that, uh, were fired from their jobs. And you know, this one case um, that we documented was uh, of a history teacher who uh, was fired after he appeared at a pro-Ukraine demonstration. How easy it was to talk to the people? Because uh, what I'm seeing, the challenge of covering Crimea, I myself try sometimes to go there, uh, that if, uh, if you are a Ukrainian reporter, you obviously you can have access to speak to the Crimean Tatars. You can have access if you maintain the contacts with the people you knew for a while, but they're usually very scared. It's very hard openly to talk to these kind of open pro-Russian authorities, because as soon as a Ukrainian reporter, you reach them, uh, you know, you can be then followed by the security service, and that's not the way you like to work. So you can, you should work very, you know, can, in a candid way. Uh, vice versa, when the Russian reporters coming, you know, um, that's very hard for them to really sometimes to to show the, especially Russian independent reporters, they can't openly, uh, due to legal restriction of the way they report and the punishment they may face for calling the Crimea occupied. Uh, um, they can't really, really talk to cover that part of the story. So really, how, repre how representative can be the coverage of Crimea and how was it for you to talk and to, you know, to have this picture, you know, the real picture of what, what is the life there? Right. No, it's a very important question. And actually, when I was um, in Europe talking to some of the members of the European Parliament and, uh, you know, the representatives of European governments, um, very, you know, th there is this lack of information that's coming from Crimea, and everyone is, you know, wants to know what's what's happening. In fact, for people, are they happy? Are they unhappy? What can be done? And this, you know, I cannot emphasize it more that this this, you know, kind of. Um, black hole that Crimea is right now for many uh, who you know who don't live in Ukraine is 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 done on purpose, of course. And Russia and um, you know Russia's policies in Crimea created serious restrictions for effective. Um, constructive human rights monitoring in uh, in the peninsula, and this must be addressed. Again, as an occupying power, Russia still has a lot of obligations um, under international law, and one of the obligations is really not to restrict um, international and other human rights monitors from accessing the peninsula. 
Uh, so, Tanya, I would also encourage our audience to watch and uh, to watch our stories. We have Romanski Crimea team and we are translating and subtitling the best of the stories from the ground as well. There was a long piece we've done uh, about the economic life, uh, what is the life in the next Crimea three years after that. So that's you can find when you um, log in into our, uh, into our um, web page. But to finalize, uh, really, so what are you would be major things, advice, concerns to address as the results of your visit? Um, you know, the main concerns that remain the same is to stop harassing and prosecuting Crimean Tatar member, uh, community members from, you know, for their, again, peaceful but insistent um, criticism of Russia's policies in the, uh, in the peninsula to uh, really take a look and start protecting the population and their access to, you know, fundamental um, freedoms. Um, that, you know, violations of which resulted after the occupation. And so, for example, um, you know, as we, um, as we talked about, allow education in Ukrainian language, allow people to access basic services such as healthcare, you know, regardless of their citizenship, allow people to be able to access, you know, to have access to employment and again, other, you know, spheres of, of their, of their lives, you know, without uh, having to go through a forcible citizenship uh, process. Okay, Tanya, thanks a lot for what you had uh, said and done. We'll look also for the report, um, which would be, uh, I see, available. And for that, um, I'd like also to uh, draw your attention to the interview we've made with Elmira Blalimova, who is the wife of the deputy uh, head of the Crimean Tata Majlis, Ahtem Chigos, who is already arrested for more than two years uh, with a false accusation of the creating the public disruption while there is a video which is confirming that he was doing actually the opposite uh, at the moment of the annexation, trying to calm down the people. Uh, and she explained to us what is the life for her, what is her, uh, what is her situation and the situation of her compatriots. It is impossible to understand how this could happen at this time, in our time, that this could happen to us, before our eyes. It's very difficult to talk about. My generation was born in deportation. I was born in Uzbekistan. But we were raised knowing our homeland was Crimea and that we must return there. Our parents did everything they could so that we could return. When we returned, we didn't ask for our homes or property back. We went to the authorities and said, give us land, we'll build, and we'll live. In 2014, they suddenly denied us entry to the other side of the barricade. They denied us the people there with whom we associated, who we considered our friends. Our points of view were in complete opposition. What seemed dangerous for us seemed very good for them. And for the first time, I remember it very well. We lived with the feeling of being in danger, the feeling of constant tension. And then Ahtem was arrested. I don't really remember that time because it was catastrophic and unpleasant for me. I just didn't know what to do at that moment, what actions to take. How did this happen? Why? What for? But after a while, I grew tired of being afraid. Now we live and are very conscious of the fact that we didn't steal anything from anyone. We are living on our land. And moreover, we have the right to live on this land. It's even more painful to see these crazy plans that individual politicians are working on, saying that Crimea should be leased to Russia for 50 years, 100 years, and so on and so forth. They are strongly provoking us. And that's why I just want to scream and say we are not serfs to be put up for rent. We are the owners of this land and we should be able to decide this question the way we want, ask us. But we also understand that Ukraine is going through hardships because there is a war in the East. People are being killed. But we really hope that society, politicians and the president of Ukraine will do everything in their power to get back Ukraine's territorial integrity and become a strong European state.
And today, the official opening of Eurovision Song Contest 2017, following the victory uh, last year of the Ukrainian Crimean Tatar singer Jamala uh, with her song 1944, reminding about her and sisters. 42 countries will participate in the contest. Portugal and Romania are to return after a year's of absence while Bosnia and Herzegovina have withdrawn on financial grounds. L Russia planned to participate as well, but after the representative Yulia Samoilova was banned from entering Ukraine because of illegally traveling directly from Moscow to Crimea, a region annexed by Russia in 2014, they refused to give a performance. And what we also know, semi-final will take place on the 9th May. May. Uh, at the grand final will be on the 3rd May. As of March, Ukraine had spent uh, 10.5 million of the US dollars for the competitions. Of course, in the run up for the uh, contest hosted by the Ukraine's capital, Kiev, police force are preparing themselves for more or less of everything, uh, with thousands of the fans coming to the Ukrainian capital from uh, 42 countries. And um, uh, safety is is today the top priority, so dog handlers, patrol officers and the special forces were, were doing whatever they wanted and our correspondent followed them. And it's rather the funny and very, um, the, the report which would show you the atmosphere of Kyiv today uh, in their preparation. It's about how the uh, special forces were preparing for the um, possible terrorist attack in the Kyiv capital. Говорю, данки не снимайте, будь ласка, ми покурим, я вас. Так достатньо. Два сценарії. Значить, з метою перевірки готовності підрозділів головного управління до виконання визначених заходів і забезпечення публічної безпеки та порядку, знайте навичок їх керівників щодо оперативного управління під порядковими і приданими силами та засобами в умовах змін оперативної установки та проведення у місті Києва пісенного конкурсу «Євробачення-2017», а також відпрацювання загадуваних дій управління корпусу та інших підрозділів головного управління. Тобто ми сьогодні в ніч з 27 на 28 проводимо спільне команда штабні навчання. Давайте не так 
сценарий номер два. Все могут спать спокойно. Я думаю, да. Должны. Опинившись на пероні, група підозрілих осіб забігла в один із вагонів метро, тільки що прибувшого составу потягу та голосно вигнукли. Всім на підлогу вагон закоплено та зробили кілька пострілів у стелі вагону. Машиніст составу метро, який вже почав рух, наказали зупинитися. Поліцейські метрополітени оточили місце події та приступили до евакуації пасажирів інших вагонів. Керівництвом ГОНП було прийнято рішення проведення плану заручних та задіяти про своїх корм. Нормально було, так? Просто я буду начала її. Треба доігрувати до кінця. Так? Так, потім готуйте сомневатися. Ушли в пост, я вам заловачу. Ні, не встановлю. Ушли в пост. Ми на жаль так і не почули в тім... Правоцентр не вряд. Це були не показательні виступлення, а реальне учення. Кілька хвилин тому цей вагон захопили озброєні зловмисники, але правоохоронці за лічені секунди звільнили заручників та знешкодили банду. Це буде все кадром. What we really would like to do to explain uh, to you what is the real discussion in the Ukrainian society regarding Eurovision. And uh, to do that, uh, we have here Volodya Yermolenko, who is our colleague from Hromatsky journalist, but also the Ukrainian philosopher, who is involved in public diplomacy, talking to a lot of experts, foreign journalists, but as well following uh, the Ukrainian society. So really, it's kind of an international event, uh, probably uh, that would be really huge things some years ago where nothing happened in Ukraine and nobody cares. But how it's now? How big the discussion in the society? Well, I think it's an, an event that uh, is an opportunity for Ukrainians to talk about themselves abroad and to debunk some myths because there is a stereotype, for example, in, in Europe that Ukraine is a country fully covered by war and that cities like uh, Kiev, Lviv, Dnipro, Kharkiv are, are not safe which is, I think, it's not, it's not true. And for Ukrainians, this is the way to show that uh, Ukrainian cities are quite safe for, for, for many people in terms of, you know, war security. I'm not talking in terms of, you know, s safety and, and terrorist attacks, which are, which are possible everywhere. But in terms of uh, uh, cities or country hit by war, cities like Kiev, Kharkiv, Dnipro, Odessa, Lviv are fully safe. I think uh, this is kind of a, uh, an opportunity to show this. Ukraine is not, uh, uh, this is not the first case when we hosting the Eurovision. We, we uh, already made it uh, some 13 years ago and afterwards there was a Euro Championship 2012. So it's always, I think it's, it's a kind of a you know, spiral uh, helping uh, the country to open itself a little bit more for, for wider public. And look, the international events always become a legitimate focus for investigative reporters because they try to find out, you know, uh, if there is any corruption involved, uh, try to determine, you know, how efficiently public money is spent, especially there is the uh, discussion then when the country is in war, how much we can spend for the entertaining event. Uh, for instance, uh, there were the case when the honorarium of uh, Jamala Eurovision winner, uh, and she had earned a bit more than 30,000 euros, had been considered, you know, really big, and that, that those money had been uh, paid by the Ukrainian state. Um, so really, how do you see that? I also would like to uh, draw a bit later your attention to today we have the um, we, we have for instance a lot of the databases where basically you can go and because of the new laws can basically 
check every salary of more or less than every person. So for instance, there would be the salary of the person A who earns you know, $2,000 um, open for the public. Then later you go for the salary, which is $200, and there would be like uh, person B. So uh, that's something there, but of course there are a lot of still complaints. So what we know about you know, the efficiency and what also are the thoughts about these kind of things? Should the country of the war you know, spend those money? Well, talking about the honorarium of Jamal, I think it's a kind of a very strange that this topic is raised because music is a kind of a very expensive thing. And uh, uh, I know I know that uh, from my personal experience, then, uh, and it's the, the, the money which is going to Jamala, which is, I think, who is a great uh, singer who made the country widely known, and especially in terms of diversity, because she's Crimean Tatar singer. I think it's, it's great, and it's a little bit exaggerated, but it shows as well how Ukrainian society can be, at this moment, be maybe too neurotic to some case, and maybe think, uh, everything in terms of war, which is again, which is, I, I think, is a trap because the war is very important, but it doesn't cover everything. Uh, from what you asked about the transparency, I think the paradox of Ukraine is that Ukraine, compared to European standards, is now one of the most transparent countries. You, you have all the um, like many of the property registers opened. Uh, journalists can can be quite free in, in uh, checking everything, not even the national one, but when I talk to regional journalists, I understand that many of them are much less dependent on the local authorities or local oligarchs than before. They can talk openly um, about all the schemes, all the problems. The problem is whether the uh, officials and whether the authorities react on that. So we are kind of uh, facing a situation of post-Orange Revolution 10 years ago, 12 year, years ago, uh, when we had quite the same. I mean, media can talk a lot, but then authorities do not react. I think th this is kind of a difference from of Ukraine from, for example, some of the Western European countries. And, of course, the biggest controversy is about the banning of Russian singer uh, Yulia Samoylova by the Ukrainian security service. Uh, she wasn't allowed to come to Ukraine uh, because she has visited uh, Crimea illegally. Uh, more or less, she uh, had uh, taken the flight from uh, Moscow to Crimea and she's now on the tour. Then there was this story that the Russia wanted to do the Skype. Uh, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the Skype video um, there you can see. But the biggest story, of course, that Yulia Samoylova is a handicapped singer. So obviously, um, people would say, you know, that it's a very, um, th there would be different things uh, said that, you know, uh, that she's in the wheelchair, that's not good from Ukrainians. I would also like to bring some tweets. Um, you can see that, for instance, the, there would be the tweet that handicapped Russian singer could be banned, and there is always uh, the, um, that would be the major a news bulletin and as well for instance even the media like BBC Radio 4 would say that uh, you know th that this is a story and so what would you see I mean we've also uh, read a lot uh, had uh, read a lot of advice from a lot of uh, you know foreign reporters that that was really a bad move speaking about the image of Ukraine uh, to do so well I disagree with them I, I and we had lots of discussions with foreign journalists and w this is very open discussion, which we held, for example, in Ukraine World Group. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's okay that we disagree. I think uh, they tend to underestimate the safety and security issue, and we tend to maybe overestimate it. But I think there are two, oh, two things. First, you mentioned that she traveled to Crimea, but not only she traveled to Crimea, but she openly uh, took a position with, that Crimea is a, is a part of Russian territory, and in this sense, of course, she banned the Ukrainian law. And uh, we we asking ourselves all the time how Ukraine should react on that. And I think Russia just make for Ukraine kind of a lose-lose situation. Anything you do will be bad. But imagine that, uh, let's imagine that she comes, and here comes my first point, the second point, she comes to Ukraine, and then this provokes a huge controversy inside the country. We have some far-right uh, activists, we have some nationalist mood, but we have some also political forces inside or outside the country that can provoke them, that can use them, that can uh, manipulate them. So if, imagine the provocations against her, I think that could have uh, very bad consequences. Uh, what is really interesting for me um, that, you know, I rarely hear that there would be some kind of demand for another EU state 
to, uh, you know, to do something else with their uh, migration law, or for instance, let the borders open for somebody who previously had violated the Schengen zone or the UK uh, migration regime. So really, that's interesting. You know, is there that the Ukrainian law on migration is considered to be, uh, I don't know, more loose or that more flexible than the laws in other country? Well, I think here we, we are facing a situation in which the debate is not political. It's not debate between the EU and Ukraine. It's a debate between Eurovision as a kind of a commercial brand and Ukraine as a state. And Ukraine as a state has all the sovereignty to protect its borders and to decide who to let in and who to not to let in. I mean, this is kind of a, if we go to international law debate, then uh, I'm sorry, but this is uh, Ukrainian sovereignty. And celebrate diversity, that's the slogan for this competition, yet there is once again controversy. Uh, there is the case of the Ark of Friendship. This is an old Soviet monument in the heart of Kiev. You can see now. Uh, and it was supposed to be painted as the rainbow flag, yet far-right group our Pravi sector had been threatening to stop the work. In the end, the mayor Klitschko decided we'll use some national Ukrainian symbols in order to kind of fill some of the gap which hadn't been yet painted. Um, so um, to, the, the question is to what extent it's indeed a concession, and really, is it the concession to the far right? You know, you know this kind of. I would also would like to bring the um, the Twitter of uh, Julian Ryopke. It's a Bild reporter who uh, said that shining the worst possible light on Kiev, uh, the European state may stop such uh, right wing extremists. By the way, and also there was the editorial in uh, Kiev Post, uh, the Ukraine. Ukrainian English speaking um, paper uh, where it's written that the 30 second video clip, while missing the point of the slogan entirely, celebrate diversity. Uh, it because it's fine to celebrate diversity as long as you are white and healthy, and it's okay to be gay as long as you are not open about it. Um, so really, um, there is also the question that, of course, the Ukrainian authorities would like to look like very open. You know, they have the European values, the whole Euro Euromaidan revolution was about that. But then they do these kind of the concessions. We can vote for amendment on the LGBT and against discrimination, but with the uh, sign that, you know, it's necessary to do because to get the visa-free regime. So what do you think is, or maybe just explain, not just your opinion, but how is the discussion, what is the discussion here? Well, I think we should understand that uh, LGBT issue is still a hot issue in Ukraine. And uh, I think it's not uh, something original. I think if you take any Eastern European country, uh, you will have the same kind of debate. If, if, even if we talk about, you know, Western Euro European countries, in France, the issue of uh, so-called the marriage, marriage for everyone was a very, very hot, and still is. So I think with this uh, topic, we should go very progressively and very, in a way, slowly. We should understand that there is an irrational mood in Ukrainian society, m among many people, even among middle-class people, that consider this topic kind of a, as obscene topic or something that is, should not be discussed. But how you see the way the Ukrainian authorities are handling well, that because really it's like they would love to look progressive at the time they do the things you know that are really just the other side of that you know uh, trying to make them later an excuse in a way that better don't ask for an excuse. Exactly. I mean, Ukrainian authorities are also trying to balance, balance you know, and uh, they understand that uh, you know patriotic mood or conservative mood in this country is uh, is something that is is a fact you cannot really change it in in one night into very liberal or leftist liberal ideas Okay, but uh, that's what we would like to um, tell you um, at the moment, you know, because there are what kind of the debates we have. I also would like to uh, show you ki some kind of the tweets we have from different people uh, who had already visited uh, Kiev, who've just arrived. Uh, the most of the people would come a bit later uh, during this week, uh, but that you can follow yourself with the different kind of the hashtags. So there are some people looking for the problems. Some people are, you know, um, speaking about what they like. So there isn't, you know, the full scale of the opinions. Um, and um, we'll also 
um, follow this week what's happening in the center of Kiev. And for in order to say goodbye, I'll propose to you to enjoy a bit of the piece of music by the Eurovision winner Jamala, who had been performing just in this just in this studio early. And I would say you goodbye. When strangers are coming, they come to your house. They kill you all and say we're not guilty. Not guilty. Where's your mind? Humanity cries. You think you are God, but everyone dies. Don't swallow my soul. Our souls.